Welcome to the current federal tax developments for the week of April 13, 2020. Current federal tax developments are brought to you by Kaplan Financial Education and your State Society of CPAs. I'm Ed Zollers from Phoenix, Arizona, and we're going to talk about what went on here the week of April 13th. Now, to be totally honest, I didn't really expect to be recording a podcast the week of April 13th when I started this year. This is the week that quite often I just kind of skip because we're in the process of closing down on the April 15th deadline. I've got lots of things happening in my office. I know most of you would have lots of things happening at yours related to this year end or to say to the uh, tax filing season end. So we figure that A, I don't have tons of time to do it and B, you don't have tons of time to listen to it. So we often kick this back, maybe record on the 16th or whatever the 16th was because we haven't had April the 15th for a long time. We were scheduled to have a real April the 15th this year, but that now has been put off. So what we're going to talk about this week is, interestingly enough, the longest uh, document I've ever done. If you download the PDF every week, this one is longer than any other we've had. And the IRS got very, very busy at the end of the week issuing guidance on the CARES Act and other items. So we'll talk about kind of what we have there, what's going on. Plus, we're going to pick up where we left off last week with the PPP loan program because the early part of this past week, we got new guidance on the PPP loan program that cleared up a lot of things but left one major area still kind of unknown. And it remains unknown here as I record this at about 2.20 p.m. on Saturday afternoon here in Phoenix. That's Mountain Standard Time. Okay, just think of it as Pacific Time for those of you who can't quite figure out what time zone Arizona is on. Uh, you know, we, we just never move our clocks, so we're on that time zone. So we'll take a look at what the IRS told us. We'll take a look at some guidance we've got, which was quite a bit, as it appears the IRS, uh, you know, IRS employees who are writing guidance have apparently finally figured out this whole working from home bit. So we, they're getting very, very good at dropping guidance, and I was kind of glad when yesterday afternoon, yesterday evening came, uh, and they stopped dropping this stuff on me because they'd been going rapid fire for two days. So we'll talk about what we've got there. But we've got quite a bit here today. So let's go ahead and get ourselves running. And we'll take a look. And first, let's start off. Let's start with where we ended last week, the Payroll Protection Program loans. And again, not really a tax issue, but it does relate to your trade-off for the various payroll tax credits and deferrals. So you have to understand the Payroll Protection Plan pro loans to understand because your client's going to make a choice between this or taking the credits. Well, we got a brand new on April the 6th set of frequently asked questions. Now, this set of questions was updated once, uh, you know, basically actually updated three times during the week. Uh, the first time was fairly minor. We made some changes to the documents that a that basically a lender would be asking for to, con for to confirm things. The second change was more significant. It was dealing with an issue uh, that had begun to be discussed as to whether a borrower could control the timing of the eight-week period. And then the end of this week, we got another update that really is only of interest to the lender. So, But it has been modified multiple times. The key warning from that is keep watching this because this program is still kind of a work in process and we may see more guidance pop up because what we didn't get by the end of the week was specific guidance of self-employed and sole proprietors and how they factor into the program, even though on Friday, supposedly, we officially opened up applications for self-employed and sole proprietors. So we've got an interesting set of things happening here. And no, we still have no real guidance on what partners are supposed to do. At this point in time, what I'm telling anybody is, remember, this is a program primarily run by the banks. The banks then approve a loan request, kick it into SBA for approval. If SBA approves it, that is, they agree they're going to pay the bank, you know, whether if you default or they're going to pay them if there's the forgiveness is shown, then the bank goes ahead and funds up the loan. So fundamentally at this point in time for unanswered questions, remember, the bank is in control. So questions are going to have to go to the bank about how to handle things. If there's not a direct answer in the frequently asked questions, the bank's going to control it. Theoretically, the bank should be following the frequently asked questions 
because supposedly, you know, they may get some pushback from the SBA if they don't. So we'll see how all this works. One of the key issues that we had, though, that was a problem last week was what in the world do we do about that crazy bit that it appeared that if you took it literally, we were supposed to subtract out the withholding taxes for the that the employee had taken out of their paycheck for federal withholding, FICA and Medicare from the amount of our payroll costs or at least subtract them out during the repayment period. Well, the SBA seems to have cleared that up now, made it very clear that, in fact, we are just going to use gross payroll, no reduction for taxes withheld. Interesting aside about this, though, in the frequently asked questions, it is the one place we get a detailed legal analysis and a footnote justifying why they've taken this position. And what that tells me is that, yeah, they're a little nervous. The law doesn't read this way or any way close to it but they're still going to push forward. This is the interpretation that Chairman Rubio had suggested they should use. And to be totally frank, my, my view on this at this point is they're, you know, they, they kind of got a justification for excluding the withholding, but they have no good way of explaining that crazy time period rule that said, you know, what, what does the February 15, 2020 to June 30, 2020 period mean in terms of that reference? So that one, they just kind of punted. Uh, we'll see. The question is, does anybody have legal standing to challenge the interpretation? Probably not legal standing to sue. So for all practical purposes, it seems like this is going to stick. Because again, the Senate's not really keen on coming back and physically meeting. And it's not clear that you could modify this significantly by unanimous consent. So we'll kind of watch what's going on. Also clarified, there was some question, the application form and the guide to lenders said that we would look at the 12 months. We would look at basically 2019 as our measuring period. But the law said prior 12 months and the interim final rule, not for borrowers, of course, which said 2019, but for not for lenders, I should say, but for borrowers said prior 12 months. So having kind of messed this up, you know, having inconsistent things between the two guides, they simply now say in the frequently asked questions that you could use either period. So your application could be using 2019. It could be using prior 12 months. My guess is the lenders are going to basically lock in on one or the other. Each lender will. So you'll probably need to do whatever the lender suggests should be done. I doubt you're going to really have a choice between the two options in giving it to the lender. The lender may feel much more comfortable with the 2019 numbers because those calendar year 2019 is going to be in many ways easier to confirm than trying to work up, you know, the three quarters plus one quarter and trying to figure out how that one will work. They also clarified that we wondered how the $100,000 limit on compensation worked. They made it very clear that that's only a limit on cash compensation paid to a single employee. And again, we prorate that for our borrowing to cover the two and a half month period. But we can go ahead and regardless of how much the person was, you know, so we limit their cash compensation to 100 grand, but we can still put on top of that their medical care coverage paid for any allocations, any amounts we're paying in for the retirement plans, the state payroll taxes, all those things can still go in and count as payroll costs for that employee. That was a very useful addition. Now, one thing that had some people upset was they made very clear that a Applicant cannot count what the applicant is paying to independent contractors or sole proprietors as a payroll cost, either to get the loan or to go ahead and be able to count that for the forgiveness when you're going to try to say that, well, look, I paid all this out in eight weeks. Uh, the document says very clearly that these people can apply for their own loan. Now, of course, we never got the second follow up piece of guidance we thought we would get when they said that, which said, OK, then how does it work for independent contractors, sole proprietors? That never came up. Friday came, presumably file and go for whatever the bank says you should be going for if you're in that position. Uh, no point in waiting at this point. Just keep going if you're applying. We also had a discussion here about professional employer organizations. And they made it very clear that, yes, if you have a PEO that you're using to pay what's effectively your employees, that you are allowed to claim, you know, to get the payment to you as the company that's, let's face it, the employees are coming to every day. 
and they tell us to the information. Now, what they'd like to have from the PEO, they tell us, is going to be Schedule R Form 941, Allocation Schedule for Aggregate Form 941 Filers. And they're saying, you know, that was attached to the PEO's 941s. If the PEO will not provide that to you, I suspect that may be a problem in a lot of cases, then you can use a statement from the PEO, but they make it very clear that they would prefer that Schedule R for the 941s to show, you know, how things are being provided. Now, they also had a section here talking about the documents a lender should review. This is what got changed in the first uh, revision that got put up on this. Again, we said we had three all week. Uh, what they do tell a lender is that a minimal review of calculations based on a payroll report by a recognized third-party payroll processor would be reasonable. Now, that may be good news, bad news. If you have a, you know, if you're using a Paychex or an ADP, one of the major payroll processors, then this may make it much easier to get your loan by just giving them the ADP report, which I believe there were three versions of by the time they finally came in line with all these rules because they kept trying to figure out what the rules were. Uh, you would give them that report and that probably will make the lender happy. If you're not using a payroll service, uh, again, it doesn't really say what they should accept. We're assuming they'll take 941s and the like, but we'll have to kind of watch that, you know. And so that minimal review of calculations should be fine. Uh, they also then made clear what they added in the revision was that per the interim final regulations, you could rely on the borrower's representations for all of the costs. So basically, you know, they could just ask for payroll information, then just go with that. Now, some lenders are clearly going to ask for more. Again, remember, it's their discretion, their program. Please remember that. You're borrowing from the lender technically, and as long as their loan, you know, stands up to SBA analysis, you know, whatever they have to do to be SBA covered for this, it meets those requirements of the program, uh, they'll get the guarantee. So be aware of that. Do not spend time telling a client a lender has to take something or, you know, or can't force them to show something because, guys, that's not really how this one works. Now, they also made clear there was a big back and forth about new customers. Do they have to clear them through the uh, FinCEN rules? Uh, basically, to know their customer, anti-money laundering, etc. Answer is yes, they need to. But if it's an existing customer has already cleared it, they don't need to get that information again. So that's why it's more difficult if you are a new customer, right? If you don't have a relationship with the bank, you haven't been cleared, that's why it's been more difficult. Or if your bank just isn't going to do it or says go elsewhere. We did have a problem part of this week. Wells Fargo hit a cap for a while based on the actions against Wells Fargo. They limited their ability to lend. Uh, they hit a cap based on that. That cap was released late in the week, and my understanding is that Wells Fargo can now lend again under the program and should be accepting applications. Now, there's the other problem. So this frequently asked questions changed all this stuff. And the questions become, oh, I should say, what I didn't put on the screen but I think is important is on the second revision of the frequently asked questions, there was a real issue raised. What happens if, you know, I want to be able to control my eight weeks, right? My business is shut down right now. This is an example that's exactly, pretty much exactly from a CBS News article that was published at the end of the week. And this is because people were saying you could do this. Well, I'm shut down right now. I don't expect we're going to be able to reopen, let's say. I mean, you know, here in Phoenix, we're closed down for sure until May 1st. And a lot of people think it's unlikely on May 1st that we're going to be told all oh, we can reopen. The state order will expire on May 1st. Not clear at all. The city will take away their order on May 1st. You know, or the city would go and the state, whether the state blocked them, that's a long question. But it seems very likely we could still be extended beyond May 1st. So thinking, well, maybe I'll get up and running by early June, and I would like to take my eight weeks starting in early June, right, some period like that, so I could use the money to get myself back up and running. You know, is that going to work? Could, could I start taking it? Could I delay the payment? So I get the money and start spending it when I need to use it. And the answer to that question basically is no. 
If you are approved, you cannot bank the loan. If you are approved for a PPP loan, the lender has 10 days from the day the approval is given to fund the loan. Why is that the case? Actually makes perfect sense if you think about the purpose of this program. The purpose of the program is to get money in the hands of employees. This is really a program that is meant to pay the paychecks of employees. The businesses are being used as a conduit. So the way the money's running is it, it goes from the bank to the business to the employee. That's the purpose of this for eight weeks to pay eight weeks worth of payroll for your employees. And we're going to give you a little benefit by allowing you to use up to 25% of the money to pay for some limited other business costs such as rent or utilities, right? Or interest on a mortgage, but not principal. So we'll do that. But that's the point of this. It is not meant to be, I think, as economist Nicole Kading has said uh, in a couple of occasions, most recently on a tax analyst podcast, uh, you know, this is meant to be kind of an economic aid package, not an economic recovery package. A recovery package would come later. So if you're thinking I could bank this loan, I'll apply for it now. And then I just won't ask for the money until I can actually reopen. That's not how it's going to work. If you get this money now, you're going to need to pay employees. Even if they're doing nothing, you'll need to pay the employees for that eight-week period. So keep that in mind. Okay, that's what I mean. You can't delay asking for funds to delay the eight-week period. If you had a loan application in before the frequently asked questions was before the most before the Monday ones were published or the later revisions, you don't have to change your loan. You can use whatever was there at the time of the application. But if your loan has not yet been processed, you are allowed to request that the lender allow you to modify the information provided to come in line with the FAQ. OK, now let's get to actual tax stuff now. We will come back to payroll here in just a second. But let's talk tax. The IRS put out on Revenue Procedure 2020-22 on the 10th of April, this was Friday, late, they did this. They put out some 163J relief for the CARES Act. The CARES Act made a number of changes temporarily to 163J. That is the limit on deduction for business interest. Under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, we put in a limit of 30% of adjusted taxable income, and that's basically tax EBITDA, right? Earnings before interest taxes, depreciation, amortization. Your interest could be no more than that. Any interest in excess of that had to be carried forward. Now, you know, what they decided was that, okay, we want to give relief. So we're going to change the 30 to 50. Part of that is because we expect that people are going to be borrowing a lot more in this period. So we're going to allow them to have a higher interest number. Part of it is to just give relief. Now, the problem is that you know, in 2018, if you were a real estate or farming business, you may have made an election to be what's called an electing real estate or farming business. That election said that I can skip this whole 163J, 30% of ATI limit, if I make this election, which is permanent forever. And when I do that, though, I have to use the alternate depreciation system, ADS lives, and methods for certain assets, right? As I recall, the way the rules work, obviously for real estate, it's real property. For farming, it was things with a class life of an excess of 10 years that I had to use ADS, which will slow up the depreciation. Now, you know, I thought it was 30%. I made my decision on 30%. That that was the, you know, that, that was the largest amount of ATI I could take. Suddenly it's 50. I might have decided to make this irrevocable election because at 30% it was never going to work. But I might have made a very different decision at 50. So the IRS is going to say, we understand that Congress said forever and ever, no taking back. But we're going to now elect, we're not going to allow you to essentially change that election. You can cease being an electing real estate or farming business for 18 or you might change it in 19. And will I even then, or I will even to make a late election in? I doubt very many will do that. Most likely we'll see elections out, right? People undoing it. That could free up deductions for interest. It could, in theory, even 
you know, in some cases create net operating losses, which go back to five years. Now, the other thing they did, the law allows for a rule that you can say, I don't want to use a 50% limit. Now, you might think, why would I want to use 50? Why do I want to go back to 30? Main reason is because, you know, we used it in 2018. It's not going to make that much of a difference. I don't want to amend the 2018 return. So this becomes what I call a Nike election. You can use the 30% limit by simply using the 30% limit. Now, why they did it that way is you made the election, quote unquote, on your original 2018 return. So you don't need to go back and do any amendments to make this election. So what they're saying is you could leave 18 and 19 at 30% if you want, if you already finished those returns. Or you can go back and undo it. You've got your choice. That's why they allow the opting out. There's also an election to use the 2019 ATI in 2020. Okay, why would you do that? Well, because we expect 2020 is going to be a really bad year for a lot of taxpayers. So what this procedure tells you what to do, and by the way, this procedure has the details of how to do this in each case. So you want to go through this procedure if you're making any of these elections and put all the right things in, put the right statements in, give the right information. It's broken that way. It is in the document. You want to go check it. Right, you want to do this. Now, if you are going to be elect to use 2019 ATI in a 2020 year, right, then what you have to do is you have to make the election right, doing following the procedure in section 6.02 of this revenue procedure. Uh, you know, you don't need a formal statement to make a revoke, you're just going to kind of use the 2020 or 2019 numbers, right? And you know, we'll be able to do that. I expect a lot of taxpayers, the 2019 ATI will be higher than the 2020. So for 2020, they'll probably use the 2019 ATI. The other thing that's in the law, and this also does, because these are all parts of the law. You know, the one that's not in the law is that ability to change your election to be an electing business. But the others were added by CARES. There is a really weird special rule that allows that says partnerships of 2019 don't get the 30%, don't get the 50%. Rather, we go ahead and compute their excess interest. And in 2020, the partner will be able to treat half of that excess interest from 2019 as fully deductible with no limits in 2020. Why they do that? Well, because of the Bipartisan Budget Act audit rules. Well, we're going to discover that we got a way around that for partnerships, but unfortunately, Congress didn't think Iris might do that or didn't think through maybe allowing certain things. So in any way, you can't get around 163J's problems by using what I'll tell you about to get out of CPAR. But you can do this. And if you don't want, but if for some reason you don't want to use the 50% excess business interest rule, they tell you how to do that. So you won't be using it 2020, the 50% interest. Maybe for some, maybe you think that actually, you know, 2020 is so bad. I would prefer to have this interest go forward when I expect I can really use it against higher income. That's at least their theory. Now, the next thing up, this is in notice 2020-24 issued on the 9th on Thursday. The CARES Act changed net operating loss carrybacks for 2018 through 2020, right? Remember, the TCJ got rid of net operating loss carrybacks. The CARES Act says, okay, guys, we're going to put them back in, and we're going to put them back in at five years like we had back in 2008 and 2009, you know, when we had the financial crisis. So we're going to have a five-year net operating loss carryback. From, for losses in 2018, 2019, 2020. And that's by default. Now, of course, you have a problem here. 2018's already been filed, and maybe I don't want to carry that back five years. Maybe I had very low tax rates then. I expect I'm going to have high tax rates. I'm a company that's actually going to make a ton of money off of all of this. So I've got really high rates. I want to be able to use it against that. The question becomes, you're past the date under normal rules to be able to waive a carryback period because you had to do that on the original return. Now the, now, the CARES Act added a provision that allows you to make that late carry forward election through the due date, including extensions of your 2020 return. But it didn't tell us mechanically how to do it. This is what this notice is going to do. If you want to waive the five-year carryback period, what you will now do is you will attach that waiver statement 
for 18 or 19, and obviously 20, if you're going to do that as well, to the 2020 return. The nature of the statement, what needs to be attached, and what it needs to say, that is found in this particular procedure. Now, there are some other special NOL rules you want to take a look at here. I won't go through them in a lot of detail because we're going to be long enough this week anyway. Uh, there is a special rule that will let you bypass the 965 years. Remember, we had the 965. We brought offshore income onshore back in 2017 for most of the clients that were affected. Some were impacted in different years, but 17 is a big issue. Well, carrying back to that could get very messy. So what they're going to allow you to do is elect, and this tells you how to do it, to elect to just skip the 965 years. The ruling does make clear, though, that that doesn't give you an extra year to go back to. So let's say you have 2018, you have your loss, you had 17 was your 965 year. If you make this election, you carry back to 13. You don't say, wait, I'm not taking 17, so I get to go an extra year to 12. That's not how this works. You're going to use 13. You're only going to have four years in your carry back calculation. You're going to skip 17. And then you're going to carry the rest forward, right? If you decide not to do that, the notice gives you the information about how to handle a 965 year in the midst of all this. And that particular thing, if you wanted to get up to speed about how you would handle it, right, in that particular case, uh, you know, if it goes to a 965 year, the deemed election or 965N cannot be waived for that year. Uh, and they tell you all the basic rules involved with that. Finally, they also give the information about how you apply this to a consolidated group of corporations. So if you have any of those situations or actually any of these, you want to read these rules. The real nice takeaway, though, is to remember, we are not going to go back and have to amend 2018's return and put a statement on it to waive the carryback. OK, we're not we're just going to put that on the 2020 return and file it with the 2020 return. Now, that's good news, but you got to remember to do it. That's the bad news. The IRS did on Friday issue a set of frequently asked questions for the employer tax deferral rules, payroll taxes. So back to payroll taxes for a second. You may remember under the under the CARES Act for wages paid on or after liabilities that arose on or after March 20, March 27th of 2020, an employer will be allowed to simply take away, not deposit the employer portion of old age survivor and disability insurance. That's 6.2% of wages number. That number for the whole rest of the year will not be deposited. You'll still deposit what you withheld from the employee. You'll still deposit, you know, the Medicare tax both sides. You'll still deposit federal withholding tax, but you won't deposit this 6.2%, the employer portion of old age survivor and disability. That entire balance, you'll keep a running total of it. Half of that amount you didn't pay in 20 will be paid on December 31st, 2021. So it'll be a special deposit that day. And then the remainder will be paid December 31st, 2022. They tell you about that here. Now, there is some clarification. There will be a new Form 941 coming for the second quarter, and they say we're going to get update instructions about how to handle this. If you had something, you know, you had a deposit in those last few days of March that's covered by this rule because there'll be a few people with that, in which case then you got to work this out as well. You know, how do we handle it for that period? And the IRS kind of gets back and says it's going to be working on it. Now, remember, they kicked most of the credits into the second quarter and said you use $7,200 if you need the money now. This one, though, is a deferral, so you can't really kick it to the next quarter easily. So they'll, they'll tell us how to deal with that. The big takeaway from this page, though, which I think is important, this was a question we didn't really know the answer to. If you claim a PPP loan and have it forgiven, you end up losing the right to do this deferral. Now, the question many had asked was, does that mean I lost it back to March 27th? So if I get a PPP loan forgiven, that I'm going to have to, when I get forgiveness, go back and immediately pay up my old payroll taxes? Or 
does it just mean we, we lose it from that point forward? So I can still take whatever I had through the date, you know, March 27th, through the date the bank finally approves my forgiveness application. And that much will still go and be paid with two payments. But for the rest of 2020, I've got to pay the full tax deposit. And the IRS said, we're going to say that you can go ahead and defer and then pay it in 21 and 22, the amounts up until the time the bank makes a termination and you know communicates that to you, that your loan has been forgiven. There's been some forgiveness on the loan. At that point, you have to stop. But it does mean, which is what's going to be useful, you will essentially then not have to come up with the cash to pay the employer payroll taxes, the 6.2 at least, during the time you're paying uh, during that eight week period, right? When you're trying to maximize the payments to the employees and get your forgiveness, you won't have to worry about somehow otherwise coming up with the money to pay the employer side of old age survivor and disability insurance. That's good news. They also remind you there are similar rules for the self-employed. In essence, half of the self-employed, you know, basically half of the self-employment tax incurred after March 27th is going to be waived on the 2019, uh, 2020 return. We'll then add that in one half in the 21 return, one half in 22. Next big thing, Revenue Procedure 2020-23 issued on April the 8th of 2020. We are going to be, the problem is we had the Bipartisan Budget Act Centralized Partnership Audit Regime. Remember we added that? And under that regime, if you couldn't opt out, you had no real way to amend a prior partnership return. You either had to go the administrative adjustment request route, which if you did that, the earliest somebody get a benefit from changing an 18 or 19 return that's already been filed would be on their 2020 tax return. So we, we finally get it probably in April of next year. And the other problem was, you know, we also had the issue that, so we're not going to get the, and the catch is we're not going to get the benefits of things like the change in qualified improvement property lives. It's going to wait until a long time to get it. Well, obviously that goes against what Congress wanted here. So what the IRS has done is they've said, Temporarily, for 18 and 19 returns, we will allow a partnership that did not opt out of the bipartisan of the Bipartisan Budget Act Centralized Partnership Audit Regime. Right? Now, if you opted out, you could do this anyway, so it doesn't matter. But even if you weren't able to or didn't opt out, you still can file an amended 1065, amended K-1s, and the partners can amend the returns. Now, you don't have to. You can stay inside CPAR. And I expect some of the really large partnerships will because the last thing they want to do is issue a ton of amended K-1s and go through all that rigmarole. But if you've got like your five, you know, you got five partners, they've got it in their uh, revocable living trust so they couldn't opt out, uh, you can actually still now revise that return and get money into the hands of the partners based on new qualified improvement property rules and other backgrounds. That'll be the good news. And the other neat thing was this amendment is not just limited to CARES Act changes. So if you've got some other problem in 18 or 19 that you need to take care of because the 18 or 19 return was an error, uh, you actually can do it now on amended return and the partners can fix it. That'll be really nice for small partnerships where some problem has been discovered. Now, as I said, it only applies to 18 or 19. In 2020, we're back under CPAR full bore. So we're not going to get out going forward. They're not removing the CPAR regime entirely. They're just giving us an out for two years so we can get those tax benefits. But this is a big thing if you work with partnerships, right? Makes it big. Now, you've got to comply with the requirements they have in here for filing how you do it, how you label the 1065 that you're going to do amended and how you fill it in. Read these rules and go over them inside the revenue procedure. But it's a really, really useful procedure. You know, you're going to want to take a look at this and not just for CARES Act items, right? If you previously filed an AAR, you're going to use that as your starting number. They've told us that already. And if you're currently under examination, you've got to get permission to use it. You've got to inform the agent, etc. But they do tell us how to make this work. Next up, we have notice 2020-26. We're going back to net operating loss rules here. This came out on Thursday along with the net operating loss carry forward rules we talked about earlier. We got this special level of relief 
for NOL carrybacks and particularly 2018 ones is where this will really be a significant relief. Normally, you can only use the form 1045 or 1139. Remember the carryback form that we thought we were done seeing? Now we're going to see it again. You, but you normally can only use that for one year, one year from the date, the year close that generated the NOL. So for 2018, the due date for a standard 1045 would have been December 31st, 2019. That date has passed. Right? The same thing for a calendar year C corporation, the form 1139. It would have passed. The period would have passed by now. You know, we couldn't use those forms. We'd have to go do 1040Xs, 1120Xs for each of the five years involved. That would be a real mess. So what the IRS has done, they have exercised their discretion to grant up to a six-month extension of time to file certain returns. So they have said, we're going to give you that six-month extension so you're okay as long as you get in that calendar year 2018 NOL carryback, as long as you file it with the IRS by June 30, 2020, you will be fine. You'll be able to use the short-term attentive refund, which is supposed to have the refund paid in 90 days. However, there's a fly in the ointment. What's our problem? The IRS has closed the service centers. And they told us this week that essentially paper, anything filed on paper is just going to sit waiting for the service centers to reopen. So I wouldn't just go send off the 1045 to the address you normally would send it to right now. Uh, yeah, yeah, you'll lock down the time frame for timely doing it, but it may not get processed for a long time. So the IRS claims they are going to give guidance. The problem is right now the IRS is fighting a pair of problems. They know that people want and need this relief, but they also have to deal with the fact that they're putting employees at risk if they have them all in there who process paper, all working closely together. So this is becoming an odd thing about how they can handle things. For the Form 7200, you notice we're faxing them in. That was how it was fixed. Now, the problem is some of these 1045s, if you have a lot of attachments, would be huge to be faxed in. So I don't know that that's a reasonable way of doing it. But the IRS is going to give us some sort of guidance about how they're going to want us to handle this situation, presumably, obviously, hopefully before June 30. So what I would say is you can start preparing up a 1045, but you probably don't want to send it in unless we start getting really close to June 30 with no guidance. And I would also tell the client, do not bet on that 90-day window being met. My guess is the service is going to pay a lot of interest on these claims because I doubt they're going to be able to process them all within the 90-day period. Finally, notice 2020-23. This was the third try of the IRS on extending things to July 15, 2020. Remember the first try, we extended the payments only, but you didn't actually get an extension of the returns. Everybody got upset about that. So then the IRS came back and said, well, the Treasury Secretary did via tweet. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to extend returns to automatically. So we got that, but that was only income tax returns. Didn't cover uh, information returns. Didn't cover anything else. We had the weird thing that the second estimate was still due on June 15th, while the first estimate was due July 15th because it only covered April 15th things. So now the IRS went back and did a third run at this. So notice 2020-23, first thing it does, every return that is due essentially from April 1st, 2020 to July 14th, 2020, every listed return is going to be subject to, it's going to be due on July 15th. That will include 706s. That will, that fall due within that time period. It will include the 1040 and the 1120 and various other things that would be due. If you have fiscal year returns that are due within that period, they will show up as well. If you have, let's say, a fiscal year return whose extended due date falls within that period, that also gets extended to July 15th. Payment of taxes specified here gets extended to July 15th. Now, there's a long list of returns in there, but people got very, very upset about it because it's like some things were clearly missing. Well, what they missed was a paragraph that incorporated by reference two things. First, the list of items that Regulation 301-7508A-1C1-4-6 
and that includes tax court petitions and claims for refund. So if you have a claim for refund, let's say the statute is expiring on your 2015 return, right? The statute or 20 should say for filing a claim for refund for the 16 return. That statute's going to expire now, right? Supposedly, it will not expire until April until July 15th. It will not expire on April 15th. Uh, if you have a tax court 90 day letter, the tax court petition, that will also be able to be held until July 15th. And I would say at this point, at least, we again, we don't know much about the future at this point. So we're just going to say all these go July 15th for now, but keep pay attention. Things might change. It also incorporated by reference the list of items in 139 page Revenue Procedure 201858. This caused a lot of confusion. Let's go carefully through this. 20 20-23 is what Revenue Procedure 201858 refers to as other guidance that triggers the extension of the items listed. 139 pages, this covers everything. I mean, 1031 exchange just issues are in here. All kinds of other things are in the list. Now, one thing not in the list got added separately is if you have the expiration of 180 days to reinvest for a qualified, uh, basically, Qualified Opportunity Zone Fund, that will also be delayed. If that your 180 days was ending between April 1st of 2020 and July 15th of 2020, as long as you get in there by July 15th, you're good. So that's going to be involved there too for the Opportunity Zone Funds. That'll help. But it also said, so we enable this super long list is enabled. A lot of people, when we heard the mention of 2018-58, went and read it and say, well, it doesn't count because it says the IRS has to issue an announcement saying this counts. What they missed was 2020-23 was the announcement. It says these count. So if you follow that order, all those things in 2018-58 work. 2018-58 is a long document. It is not easy. You know, it's. I mean, you can slog through it. You'll find things. But I, I will tell you, using the search function in Acrobat is incredibly helpful in going through that. The PDF, we've got a link to the PDF on the IRS website in the materials this week. You want to download this week's materials, which are on our website, currentfulltaxdevelopments.com, our weekly audio and video updates. Go get those materials this week. It's really important. But we have those links. You can find it there. Some of the things that clearly are covered, uh, the any claim for refund I mentioned, Form 990 is in 2858, right? Form 5227 is in there as well. Uh, anything attached to the Form 1040, so like Schedule H, etc. Now, be careful there because some of those forms like Schedule H could be filed separately from a 1040 or not attached to 1040. If you're filing that way because, let's say, your taxpayer doesn't have to file a 1040, but they do have household employees, I'm not sure how many of those there are, but I assume there's some, uh, your client, you know, in essence, that schedule H is not extended. So your client might want to file a 1040 this year to do nothing more but allow the schedule H to be deferred. So be careful. If you're filing any of those documents, the 5471 is in there, the 5472 is in there. You know, we got a whole list of these things. As long as they're filed attached to a 1040-1120, the tax return, they come in. Anything files an attachment to the return that can be filed that way is in. Okay, really big. So I think now we've got virtually everything extended. The big missing thing, Form 941. That is unlikely to be extended because, remember, all of those payroll tax credits are how we're funding a lot of relief to small businesses. If we get rid of that and we're not computing our deposits and we don't know, you know, what the payroll taxes are, so we don't know how much refundable credit we have and we don't get that refundable money back to ourselves, yeah, this just doesn't work. Also, I really do think the IRS may be very concerned that if they did allow 941s to go off to the side, a lot of small companies would ignore their payroll stuff entirely. And that could create huge trust fund penalty problems uh, when we finally get restarted. Because there are already going to be enough of those. The companies won't make their deposit. A lot of responsible persons don't know about the responsible person penalty. And that's probably going to be bad anyway. If you actually took 941s off the table, that could go from bad to awful. So 941s are not included. Well, 
you know, we're actually going to have CPE, and in fact, already thinking about something. It looks like we well, could have an update class on nothing but all these COVID-19 changes, right? We may need a course on that here shortly. We may have all kinds of other things. So although it'll probably be different, at least to start the CP season, I, you know, I suspect for a few months there won't be live sessions. Some societies already announced, you know, like live sessions are off the table through the end of June. They'll only be virtual, but there will be virtual sessions. So take a look at what CP you're going to have. Obviously, we're scrambling a bit on getting CPE together and what's going to happen. But there will be at least some of the live sessions will be simply converted over to webcast. Uh, some of them, like here in Arizona, where we just do, you know, basically simulcast. It'll just be a webcast. And we'll do the session for those until we can actually get back in the building. Uh, you know, back in the building, at least. Well, I guess I may be able to get in the building to, to do it and broadcast. But I doubt they're going to let all of the, all the basically, you know, those who want to attend in there because of the danger of, creating a big group of people together. And if one of them has COVID-19 and we don't have any vaccines or anything yet, that would be a problem. So, you know, we'll see how that goes. But, you know, we will have that stuff. Take a look. There's definitely stuff to learn. There is a lot coming out of the IRS. And frankly, at the rate they were going on Friday, I'm thinking we're going to have some more next week. Uh, you know, we'll see when they finally get everything out of the pipeline. And they're just down to more regular release schedule. But a lot of this stuff, I think, was pent up because they knew they needed to do it. They weren't able to get the reviews done. When they finally got everybody hooked up and were go, suddenly the reviews came out. This has been the current federal tax developments for this week for Kaplan Professional Education or State Society of CPAs. Again, our updates, we post them at currentfilltaxdevelopments.com on the website so you can check in there when something happens. If you have any questions or comments, you can basically email me at zollers at currentfilltaxdevelopments.com. You can follow me on Twitter. There, the name is at Ed Zollers. Uh, you can also follow discussions on my on the subreddit, not mine, I should say. This is the subreddit for tax pros, slash r slash tax pros. I do check in from there from time to time. I've been a little bit busy on the Connect sites this week, especially for New Jersey and Arizona for the past couple of weeks. So I haven't gotten back to slash r slash tax pros uh, as much as I would like. Uh, but we do look in there. Uh, also, I've been trying to look in some on California's group at Tax Talk for California. Uh, state society discussion groups, if you have access to those, those have been hugely useful in handling this situation. A lot of information, people comparing notes, what local banks are doing for PPP, how this is working. It's a really useful thing. And if your state society has such a group and it's not very active, consider getting it active now, getting involved, posting information you've got and starting that exchange going. That's really going to be important. That kind of exchange is really helpful. OK, well, like I said, the IRS appeared to be revving up and, you know, they went all the way through the end of Friday, kept issuing stuff. We'll see if they pick up on Monday. I expect at least a few things to come out next week. We also will probably continue to have some developments on the PPP programs. And who knows if we're going to get CARES Bill number two, uh, how that'll go. The uh, Senate and House and the D's and the R's are fighting right now. So we'll, you know. See how that goes. My, my guess is when we finally get right up to running out of money for PPP, that's when everybody will finally say, OK, we're out of time to negotiate. We're just going to do something now and go. But we'll probably keep negotiating right up until that happens. That's just how these things work. So be aware of that. But I expect we'll see something more. And, uh, you know, stay safe. Uh, you know, stay yourself socially distanced. And we will see you back here in a week. We'll try to go over what's happened in the following week when we're past April 15th. And we discover it doesn't matter here on Current Federal Tax Development.